Tonight, shaken up, an earthquake rattles nerves in New York City and beyond. Tremors felt by millions, but leaving little damage. When my desk started shaking. I was like, this ain't normal. The ripple effect from Philadelphia to Boston. Israel outlines military errors that left seven aid workers dead, including a Canadian. He's gone, still doing what he loved to do. Also exclusive details on a new lawsuit after a Canadian airline crew was detained for eight months. I need answers. I need to find out what happened, what went wrong. You never know what your actions will do. Plus, a life-saving legacy six years after the Humboldt bus crash. And total eclipse tourists. We're both have the biggest crowd in Niagara Falls history. Getting ready for visitors seeking out the best views. CTV National News with Heather Butts. Good evening. Millions of Americans are on alert for aftershocks tonight after a 4.8 magnitude earthquake rattled much of the eastern seaboard. The quake struck right between New York City and Philadelphia, the strongest in the region in more than a century. The earth cam from the top of the Statue of Liberty capturing the moment. Skyscrapers shaking, some homes were evacuated. Crews tonight inspecting bridges, rail lines and tunnels. It was felt by people from Maryland to New Brunswick. CTV's Andrew Johnson starts us off. In a region that rarely feels the earth tremble, a Friday morning quake put a scare into people and their pets. What the hell? I'm having an earthquake. Holy f The shaking interrupting everything from streaming. Yo, is this an earthquake? To getting some sleep. I was laying down, my desk started shaking. I was like, this ain't normal. Neither was today's meeting of the UN Security Council. Earthquake. Is that an earthquake? Yeah. You're, you're making the ground shake. <laughs> At the ballpark in the Bronx, it hit during batting practice before the Blue Jays went on to beat the Yankees. It was felt by, by millions of people across uh, Eastern North America from south of Washington, D.C. to New Brunswick and southern Quebec and southern Ontario. Seismologists say the earthquake centered in New Jersey was felt so far away because of what's beneath. It's very hard rock, it's old rock, it's very stable. And so seismic waves, that shaking, travels a long distance. There was no major damage or injuries, but the unusual jolt did rattle nerves, anxiety acknowledged by New York's mayor. And I encourage New Yorkers to check on uh, their loved ones to make sure that they are fine, not only from the infrastructure damage, but this could be a traumatic moment for individuals going through uh, an earthquake. Despite concern over aftershocks, there were at least 10 by early evening, New Yorkers were advised to, quote, go about their normal day. After a morning, that was anything but. To give you an idea of just how rare this is on the East Coast, the earthquake today is actually the largest to hit New Jersey in more than 240 years. And a fresh reminder, experts say it can happen anywhere. Heather. Thanks, Andrew. A third Canadian missing in the aftermath of the devastating earthquake in Taiwan has been found safe. Buildings damaged in the country's worst quake in 25 years are now being demolished, while efforts to rescue hundreds who are trapped are being hampered by the threat of rock falls and landslides. Two soldiers have been dismissed and three others reprimanded for their roles in drone strikes that killed seven aid workers in Gaza. The IDF admitted a catalogue of failures, blaming the incident in part on a case of mistaken identification. World Central Kitchen is calling for an independent investigation. It's a demand echoed by the partner of the Canadian killed in the strike. She spoke with CTV's Heather Wright today. A series of failures is how Israel has described the deadly airstrike that killed seven aid workers in Gaza earlier this week. This tragic mistake could and should have been prevented. For Sandy LeClaire, this is more than just a tragic mistake. 
This is a disaster. This is a war on humanity. LeClaire's partner, Jacob Flickinger, was among those killed. She says he was supposed to leave Gaza this week and return to their home in Costa Rica, where they are raising their 18-month-old son, Jasper. We had an amazing life as a family. We had an amazing bond, three of us. LeClaire is joining World Central Kitchen in calls for an independent commission to investigate what happened. After the release of Israel's report this morning, the WCK said in a statement, the IDF cannot credibly investigate its own failure in Gaza. According to the IDF report, soldiers mistakenly believed a Hamas militant was on top of one of the aid trucks holding a gun. They fired a missile, and when two people escaped and got into a second vehicle, another missile was launched. The military confirms there were survivors from that second explosion who were able to get into a third car, but they too were killed when that vehicle was hit. <laughs> After days of international outrage and in response to U.S. demands, Israel has announced it will open new routes to allow more aid to flow into Gaza. They are now listening to what the international community have been saying for months. Um, and let's just hope that that now changes the Israeli way of doing business come humanitarian support and maybe a little bit more precision in the prosecution of this war. Sunday marks six months since Hamas's brutal attacks on Israel and the deadly war that has been waged since. Sandy LeClaire says she is not mad at her partner for going to Gaza to help. She's proud and will make sure Jasper grows up surrounded with stories about his dad. I will bring up those memories. I will show him what happened. I will show him how his dad um, left as a hero. This weekend, the latest round of talks aimed at reaching a deal for a ceasefire are set to begin in Egypt. Heather. CTV's Heather Wright. Thank you. A motion tabled in the House of Commons in response to the conflict led to a period of serious reflection for Liberal MP Anthony Housefather, who said today he will stay in caucus. There were extensive conversations I had with the Prime Minister where he committed to me that tackling anti-Semitism would become a top government priority and that I would play a leadership role in that. The fact that I will now be involved in that and, and, and join with him and Deborah in playing a leadership role and trying to solve some of these issues, trying to make things better for the community that right now feels very, very scared and very, very frightened, that's what sealed the deal. Last month, the majority of the Liberal caucus voted in favor of an NDP motion on Palestinian statehood, a move that had Housefather believe a line had been crossed. A development tonight in the story of a Canadian airline crew that was detained in the Dominican Republic for almost eight months after discovering cocaine stashed on their jet. A lawsuit against the RCMP, the federal government and Pivot Airlines is now in the works. CTV's Avery Haynes has our exclusive update. This $16 million statement of claim was filed today on the two-year anniversary of this. Agencias de inteligencia. It was April 2022 when the Pivot Airlines crew discovered hundreds of kilos of cocaine as their plane was about to depart the Dominican Republic for Toronto. Instead of being hailed as heroes, they were tossed in jail and then kept under house arrest for nearly eight months despite a public plea to bring them home. Mr. Prime Minister, we need your help to get us home. We did our job by reporting these drugs. Now we need you to do yours. The lawsuit alleges that the Canadian government did nearly nothing to secure the crew's release. Why did they leave me there for eight months? Why did they not try to get us out or at least tell us that they were trying to get us out? Through our investigations, we revealed that a number of passengers had extensive ties to Alberta's drug trade. We identified the alleged Canadian mastermind of the smuggling plot. Avery Haynes from W5. And we tracked Just down the person who paid for the charter flight through a company which didn't exist. Pivot Airlines, this lawsuit claims, should have taken steps to vet what turned out to be a fake company. I need answers. I need to find out what happened, what went wrong why they let us be in that position. But the most damning allegation involves information W5 uncovered, that the RCMP was aware of a plan to smuggle hundreds of kilos of drugs from the Dominican into Pearson Airport. This lawsuit alleges that the RCMP, whether in a deliberate operational decision or through negligent inadvertence, took no reasonable steps to warn Captain De Venanzo or protect him from this considerable danger. If you knew that this was going on, 
um, you put people at risk, innocent people at risk for no reason. Um, and if that's the case, it can't happen again. It, it just can't happen again. This lawsuit specifically mentions W5's reporting and notes it's unknown whether the RCMP followed up on any of our leads. Avery Haynes, CTV News, Toronto. Two First Nations men who were wrongfully convicted for the murder of a Winnipeg man half a century ago are now taking three levels of government to court. Alan Woodhouse and Brian Anderson, both in their 60s now, were acquitted last year after being sentenced to life in prison in 1974. They are seeking an unspecified amount in damages and claim their conviction was a result of systemic racism. There was no public warning, despite a number of senior government officials having crucial information about China allegedly meddling in federal elections. This was revealed at the public inquiry into foreign interference, which wrapped up its first week of hearings today. CTV's Judy Trin on the testimony. The inquiry heard that a panel of five public servants had access to all top secret information revealing that foreign interference was happening, but chose not to issue warnings. It was worried that it would create an impression that Canada's democratic institutions lacked integrity. The information gathered by this election task force found that China was the biggest threat. In 2019, intelligence revealed Beijing may have been trying to funnel $250,000 to proxies to help seven liberals and four conservatives get elected. Yes, foreign interference takes, is taking place, has taken place during these elections. However, based on at least what I know, and I concur with the, the panel conclusion, this did not amount to in, uh, impact the integrity of the election. The meddling continued in 2021, specifically in Vancouver and Toronto ridings, where there were large numbers of Chinese Canadians. Intelligence revealed a disinformation campaign on WeChat, painting conservatives as anti-China. Election officials were asked why they didn't take action on that when they did ask Facebook to remove a false article about Justin Trudeau in 2019. The Buffalo Chronicle article as being something that was highly inflammatory and what was seen that it might go viral and become a national event. Declassified intelligence also points to the likelihood that India and Pakistan were also using clandestine methods to influence Canadian elections. But the methods those two countries were using paled in comparison to alleged Chinese interference. Heather. Judy, thank you for this. Aimed at winning over younger voters, the Prime Minister is pitching a $600 million package to build more homes for less. We want to accelerate the pace of home construction to levels not seen since the end of the Second World War. Justin Trudeau continuing his pre-budget blitz with another announcement. This latest funding focuses on prefabricated and modular housing and low-cost financing for new rental projects. If you're looking for work, you're not alone. Canada's unemployment rate jumped to the highest level in more than two years. A sizable share of the increase due to new job seekers, young people and recent graduates. The March report is the last piece of major economic data for the Bank of Canada to consider ahead of its next rate decision. CTV's Kamal Kramali joins us now, and Kamal, much of this has to do with higher interest rates. Heather, you have high borrowing costs really weighing down on businesses who may not want to hire. And then on top of that, you have a strong population growth really adding to that labor supply, and that's really what's causing the increase in the jobless rate. 6.1% is a 0.3% increase from last month. After the economy dropped about 2,200 jobs, there is also an increase of about 60,000 people who are searching for work or temporarily laid off. The total number of unemployed people in Canada is now at 1.3 million, an increase of a quarter of a million people since this time last year. Analysts say a big reason why the jobless rate is increasing is not new arrivals to Canada, but instead students and new graduates. I think they're not going to gamble and cut those rates too early. They're going to wait to the last possible moment. But this now adds fuel to that fire that says, OK, when you're ready to go in June, it'll be a great time to go. And maybe even at that point, we might see a half a percent cut rather than a quarter of a percent. The Bank of Canada's next interest rate decision is next Wednesday. Heather. All right, Kamal, thank you. 
Just days after police revealed they seized hundreds of stolen cars bound for overseas, a new survey shows public trust in timely police response on car thefts may be dwindling. Nearly 40 percent of just over a thousand people surveyed across the country say they were not confident in recovery efforts. Only 4 percent think police could find stolen vehicles. Coming up, cities in the path of totality prepare for a rare cosmic event. But if you spread it out all along Queen Victoria Park, all along the Niagara Parkway, we can fit a, we can fit a million people. The craze and concerns over the solar eclipse, plus a lasting legacy honoring the humble Broncos. The countdown to the historic solar eclipse has reached fever pitch tonight, with National Geographic pointing to Niagara Falls as one of the best spots to view this phenomenon. And that's where we find CTV's Adrian Gobriel ahead of the astronomical event. This is a town built on the back of tourism. And yet even Niagara Falls isn't completely sure what to expect on Monday. I'm nervous because we're about to have the biggest crowd in Niagara Falls history, uh, but on the other end, I'm really excited. The incoming celestial spectacle has triggered a unique sense of anticipation on these streets. So guys, we have to make sure the banners are ready for outside. Inside Casablanca restaurant owner Nasir Dahawi is preparing for a tidal wave of customers. We bought almost two tons of chicken, almost two and a half tons of lamb and beef. We bought three skits of water. Six months ago, the restaurant also started to source ISO certified solar eclipse eyewear. How many eclipse glasses have you sold here at the restaurant? 20,000. 20,000? Yes. And how many are you expecting to sell? 100,000. If you're searching for a picturesque place to view the total eclipse, according to National Geographic, Niagara Falls is the place to be. The eclipse will begin here at 2.04 p.m. Eastern, ending shortly after 4.30 with totality occurring at 318. The moon will completely cover the sun here for nearly four minutes. With one million people expected to arrive, these $5 parking lots are sure to charge a few more bucks. So $5 an hour now on uh, Monday, maybe, maybe $100? I hope so, I think so. Though just finding a place to park may be a milestone come Monday. Is there a chance that traffic could be so bad that some people just might not be able to get here? That is a possibility and it's a concern. If you're waking up Monday morning and you're like, heck, let's go to Niagara Falls and that's the first time you've thought about it, you're already behind your planning. Yet this is a town that has been planning and preparing for this moment, which will indeed be etched in history. Previously, the largest gathering at the falls was 150,000 people. Monday's festivities are poised to shatter that. And with good reason, the next eclipse scheduled to pass over this region is in 120 years. Adrian Gobriel, CTV News, Niagara Falls, Ontario. One of the most iconic stars of rock music was remembered today, three decades after his death. Twenty-seven-year-old Kurt Cobain, the frontman of Nirvana, died by suicide after battling addiction and depression. His daughter, Frances Bean, who was not even two years old at the time, posted a tribute online, saying, I wish I knew my dad, adding he is present in so many ways. Still ahead, the pull of the purple. What's behind the rare royal hue to a natural Bavarian beauty? A lake in the Bavarian Alps is drawing large crowds these days for a rather unique reason. The waters have turned purple, deep purple, a phenomenon caused by sulfur bacteria that normally sit deeper in the lake but can occasionally come to the surface and create the colored effects. The last time this happened was in 2021. An elite French diver saw the funny side of a faux pas at a prized Olympic venue in Paris with French President Emmanuel Macron watching. The 26-year-old lost his footing, took a tumble, hitting the board with his back, 
before bouncing into the pool. He handled the flop swimmingly, mocking his own misfortune, sharing the scrapes on his back. His stroke of bad luck gave people a good laugh. The most esteemed prize for the Professional Women's Hockey League now has a name. This is the Walter Cup, named after the Walter family that was integral in launching the league. Six teams will be competing for the coveted championship trophy once the playoffs open next month. After the break, an enduring legacy. Finding hope in hardship in the face of a hockey tragedy. A somber anniversary this weekend. Six years ago, the horrific Humboldt Broncos bus crash claimed the lives of 16 people. A grieving hockey community is teaming up to heal without ever forgetting loved ones. CTV's Allison Bamford has the story. The grieving in the morning is every day. It never goes away. April 6th marks one of the darkest days in Saskatchewan's history, and every year the Boulets think about the moments leading up to the bus crash that killed their son and 15 others. We get to the crash day, and then the, the 7th is always like, I, it is the ray of sunshine. April 7th, now known as Green Shirt Day, honors Humboldt Bronco Logan Boulet. The 21-year-old signed his organ donor card just a month before his death on his birthday, allowing him to save six lives through organ donation. In the weeks following, his story inspired almost 150,000 Canadians to register as donors and years later, improvements to legislation. It's an automatic referral now. You're automatically an organ donor in Nova Scotia. You never know what your actions will do and how that that will make an impact on other people. But once it caught up to you, it, it caught up to your heart. Logan isn't the only one with a lasting impact. Crash survivor Tyler Smith went on to become a mental health advocate and win Amazing Race Canada. And Broncos goalie Jacob Wasserman recently qualified for the Paralympics in rowing. So many positive things have come out that would never have happened. Now the team's lasting legacy will live on permanently here at the crash site. Concept plans released this week show a memorial pond and monument as part of a future tribute. Whatever we do in our loved one's name isn't just about us and it's just not about them, it's about everybody. The Boulets say their house will go quiet on the crash anniversary. As a family, they plan to donate plasma. And every April 7th, they visit Logan's grave to do something he loved, build Lego. Allison Bamford, CTV News, Regina. That is our newscast for this Friday evening. I'm Heather Butts. For all of us at CTV National News, thank you for watching. Todd Vanderhayden is here for me tomorrow, and I'll see you again on Sunday. Good night.